Welcome to our monthly writer's lunch. Mechanics Institute is thrilled to have you all here for our casual and virtual brand bag lunch, which we hold on the third Friday of each month. These writer's lunches are moderated by the amazing Cheryl J. Bazet-Boutet. Expect engaging discussions on craft, informal presentations covering various forms of writing, and of course, excellent conversation. Today, we're diving into the topic, crafting books and stories for children and youth with Lisa Brown, Glodine Champion, and Oliver Chen. I'm Nico Chen, the program manager here at Mechanics Institute. To our returning members, it's wonderful to see you again in this virtual space. And for those of you who are new to this gathering, a very warm welcome to you. Established in 1854, Mechanics Institute is one of San Francisco's most vibrant literary and cultural hubs nestled in the heart of the city. Housing a comprehensive general interest library, an internationally renowned chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and the esteemed cinema lit film series. SF Standard calls us the coolest library in downtown San Francisco and a sanctuary <laughs> for remote work. Experience the magic of Mechanics Institute firsthand by joining us for a free tour every Wednesday at noon. This session of Writer's Lunch celebrates Children's Day, which is celebrated on May 5th in South Korea and Japan, on the second Sunday of May in Spain and the United Kingdom, and on the second Sunday of June in the United States. We celebrate children and their families at Mechanics Institute on every third Saturday from 10 to 11 a.m. for our Family Story Hour, which happens on site at Mechanics Institute's gorgeous second floor library. Join us on site tomorrow, July 18th from 10 to 11, during which we'll read two to three stories appropriate for children age eight and younger. Plus, make a fun craft to take home. Mechanics Institute is also planning a very special family story hour for our upcoming 170th anniversary celebration on July 13th, 2024, so save the date. This will be a full day celebration. We'll have a plethora of events and activities throughout the day and into the evening. Keep your eyes peeled because we'll be posting the full schedule on our website soon. This special family story on July 13th will be scheduled from 10 to 11 a.m during which we will be highlighting translated and bilingual children's books until 3 p.m. in our third floor library. The Center for the Art of Translation will be curating a table of translated children's books, and we'll also have Asia Pack books, the medium, and transit children's editions tabling there as well. In addition, our partners at San Francisco Public Library will also be giving out free children's books just outside of our building. During our discussion today, we also invite you to participate in the Q&A session. So please click that chat button below on your Zoom screen and enter your questions and in, into the chat because we will make sure to address them during the latter half of today's Writer's Lunch. I will now go on to today's speaker bios. First up, we have Lisa Brown. Lisa Brown is a New York Times bestselling illustrator, author, and cartoonist. Her award-winning picture books include The Airport Book, The Hospital Book, How to Be, Mummy Cat by Marcus Ewert, Emily's Blue Period by Kathleen Daly, and The Two Much Sisters by Carol Brendler. She has collaborated on three books with the author Lemony Snicket, The Locker Who Couldn't Stop Screaming, 29 Myths on the Swinster Pharmacy, and Goldfish Ghosts, and is the creator of Baby Be of Use, a series of board books for McSweeney's, including the absolutely essential Baby Mix Me a Drink. Her comics include a graphic novel for teens, The Phantom Twin, and a collection of novels, Long Story Short. Lisa also teaches a picture book writing and illustration class at California College of the Arts and is on the board of 826 Valencia, a writing and tutory center for students in San Francisco. Now up, it's Glodine Champion. Glodine Champion is a two-time TEDx speaker and keynote speaker who pulls from her mother's influence, her first authentic leader, to create stories about life, leadership, and accepting that con uh, acceptance that connect with people. She is a master storyteller whose thought-provoking ideas are shared with honesty, authenticity, and vulnerability. She is a Six Sigma black belt with over 20 years of experience as a lean Six Sigma leader. DEI disruptor and master educator. 
And she is also the celebrated author of the award-winning coming-of-age novel, Salmon Croquettes, and loves her Tibetan terrier, Tashi, her weighted blanket, breakfast for dinner, and self-love Sunday is her favorite day of the week. Welcome, Glodine. We also have Oliver Chin on this wonderful panel today. Oliver Chin founded A Medium, an independent San Francisco publisher of wonderfully diverse children's books. More than 50% of them feature multicultural characters, and over 25% of these books are bilingual. A Medium publishes the original stories of The Octonauts, which inspired the hit animated TV show Worldwide. Oliver has written more than 20 books for youth, including The Year of the Dragon from the Tales of the Chinese Zodiac series, The Discovery of Chess, the illustrated anthology, More Awesome Asian Americans, and Julie Black Belt. Previously, he wrote the sports commentary of uh, the Tao of Yao, insights from basketball's biggest, uh, brightest big man and the graphic novel Nine of One, A Window to the World. A magna cum laude graduate of Harvard, he was the cartoonist for the Harvard Crimson. Earlier in his career, Oliver helped introduce anime and manga such as Pokemon and Dragon Ball Z to the United States. Called a comics expert by the San Jose Mercury News, he regularly presents at schools, libraries, and cultural associations. Last but not least, I'm going to read the bio of our amazing moderator, Cheryl J. Bizet Boutte. Cheryl um, is an award-winning author and Pushcart Prize nominee. She is also a Oakland multidisciplinary writer whose autobiographical and fictional short story collections, along with her lyrical and stunning poetry, artfully succeed in getting across deeper messages about the politics of race and economics without breaking out of the narrative. An inaugural Oakland Poet Laureate runner-up, she is also a popular teacher, literary reader, presenter, storyteller, curator, and MC host for many, many literary and poetry events. And now I'm going to pass the mic to the wonderful Cheryl. Cheryl, get us started. Thank you so much, Nico. And welcome, uh, Glodine, Oliver, and Lisa, and all of you writers out there in Zoom land. And I hope you um, are going to enjoy what you hear today. Let me start with my first question. Um, and I will start with you, Oliver, on this first question. What should a writer be keenly aware of when contemplating or writing for children or youth? Uh, thanks a lot, Cheryl. Uh, aside from anyone's personal interests, uh, you know, that's obviously the starting point. But I, I think one thing that I would recommend, which may not be uh, someone's gut reaction, is to actually go out to the bookstore or the library or the internet and see if someone's done that book before. <laughs> if they've done that topic or anything close to it, I mean, it's not necessarily a buzzkill, but I do think that it's important to know if you're interested in publishing your book as opposed to sharing it with family or friends, that uh, if something does exist, you should be aware of it and you should actually try to read it just to see if it's anywhere close or overlaps your uh, original idea. Good advice. What about you, Glodine? You got to unmute. Totally agree with Oliver. Uh, in fact, um, the book that came closest to my book was um, Coffee Will Make You Black. So um, I wanted to make sure that that Zayla's story was completely different. But, you know, the more I also feel like the more books that are out there with the same subject matter told from a different perspective uh, is helpful. Right. Um, right. So, yeah. And you, Lisa? Well, piggybacking on that, uh, going out and looking at picture books, um, I would recommend going to the library, going to the bookstore, not just seeing what's out there, but seeing what grabs you. I think everyone, we had an icebreaker when we talked about books that impacted us as um, children, but there are so many more books out there now for children, um, everyone, um, one of the problems with uh, books for children is everyone just buys the ones that they remember, which is wonderful. There are wonderful books we remember, 
Um, but there's also such fabulous things coming out right now and seeing what you connect with versus what you think a child would connect with is um, super valid as well. So I think go look, read, sort of educate yourself on how a book is done for children right now and talk to well, Lisa, librarians. Lisa, let's continue with that because I think that that conversation we had earlier is worth sharing a bit with the, with the, the writers out there. Uh, what, what books impacted you the most as a child and, and why? Um, I always liked uh, sort of spooky stories. Um, I, I write a lot of spooky stories. I think that um, I'm, I'm I always try to figure out why. Um, I think it's uh, sometimes spooky stories have sort of an outsider bent. And I think there are people who just about everyone as a child, as a preteen, as a teen feels like an outsider or um, at one point or another. And I think connecting with that kind of outsider um, is really important. I mean, I think we, we all agree that seeing ourselves in books is really important, um, especially as children. So I think, um, I'm just trying to throw some titles out there that I loved as a child. We talked about where the wild things are. Um, I had a very um, deep love for this strange series that from the 70s or 60s um, called The Lonely Doll, which was photographed about a little doll sort of alone in an apartment in New York. Um, there was a book called A Woggle of Witches. Um, I just really was very um attracted to sort of not quite fantasy but um something happening in the real world that was extraordinary thank you how about you glodine uh my books ranged like i was saying earlier um uh i started reading what my mother started giving me books way early um as soon as i started reading but I just thought right now, one of the book series, and I don't know how I got onto this book series, um, V.C. Andrews, remember uh, Flower oh, yeah. the Attic and all Flower of that? The attic. <laughs> I love those books and I don't, I don't remember how I got introduced to them, but I read them like I read Judy Bloom. I think part of it is because I'm adopted and there was something that I connected with yeah. in those stories. Um, although I'm so grateful my mother didn't lock me in a, room in the top, <laughs> of, the top of the house <laughs> but um yeah judy bloom and definitely where the wild things are um oliver had mentioned richard scary and i loved um uh what do people do all day um yeah so many so many books and and i think that now is like a critical time for us to really um think about how children are getting introduced to books uh, and the kind of books they're being introduced to. And, you know, I hate to say this and the books that are being banned yeah, uh, for various reasons. Cause um, you know, all of those books, even are you there? Are you there? God, it's me or no, I'm sorry. Um, Forever. Judy Bloom wrote a book called Forever. And because there was sex in the book, there was this big thing that I couldn't read the book and I snuck and read it anyway. Like yeah. you can't give a kid a book and get them to start love reading and then start telling them that there's certain books what they, they can't read because yeah. that's going to make them want to read it anyway. <laughs> but um, I feel like there's so much that we can learn, especially from children's books, if authors are gentle with the things that they're introducing. Um, to a young mind. So those were those were some of my favorites. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, my daughter and I still have our full set of uh, B.C. Andrews books. Every what? Single, every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver, how about you? Uh, well, Lisa and uh, Goldine mentioned a lot of classic titles, and uh, I want to pick up on what Lisa mentioned about being an outsider. So uh, I think when I got a little older, probably middle elementary school, I, I found Bill Pete, and I didn't know his background. I later learned he was a Disney animator, but um, he talks and he writes and he draws a lot about outsiders, but they're all animals. And I think using uh, cute critters as a, 
a fantastic way to convince readers to put themselves in the, the shoes or the paws of somebody else. And um, his books have, you know, that second layer of meaning beyond just the expository. And I, I really, uh, it, this was like a worm that stuck into my brain, not quite like uh, RFK. And I think <laughs> that um, being able to understand metaphor and be exposed to it in a way which uh, isn't, you know, pontificating or uh, didactic is a challenge for an author, but it's a reward for the reader. And I, I admired his approach to doing that. Oliver, let me let me piggyback on um, uh, the comment you made about the, the use of animals. Um, you know, as, as writers, we know that uh, children's books are still to this day more likely uh, to use, uh, to feature white children and use animals than they are to feature uh, children of color. How do you, and or how are you overcoming this and um, what are you doing to to um, change that dynamic? Uh, well, I think uh, animals are it's not an either or. I love animals. I like books with animals. I think animals represent a world where unlike a zoo, uh, you know, where there are no bars or, or walls, you know, it's a metaphor for how everyone can get along and not just tolerate each other, but accept each other. And like, that's kind of the world that Richard uh, Scary presented. But for me, it was an intentional goal to increase the representation of multicultural characters. Uh, because when I was a, a child, when I went to the library, I didn't see very many books that featured uh, people of color. And when I became a parent and a father of two boys, and we went back to the libraries and the stores, and things hadn't really changed in that in those decades. And so I thought, you know, there's something I could do, but enjoy. Uh, maybe on one hand, I would publish some books about animals, but then on the other hand, I'd be intentional about creating stories which did feature uh, people of color. And so um, we've kept at it, you know, since 2005, and uh, we've definitely produced probably close to 30 books, uh, which fit those criteria. And, you know, they're not meant just to check a box, but they're meant to be fun stories that anyone from any background could enjoy. And uh, hopefully we've been able to get those into people's hands from all walks of life. Wonderful. Claudine? Well, I have, I, I know how you did here. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I don't think that I read a lot of books growing up that represented me that looked with with kids that look like me and so it was really important when I wrote Sam and Croquettes especially because of the subject matter um it's a coming-of-age story about a young girl struggling with her sexuality and because of the way that sexuality is is viewed in the black community it was important for me um to make her non-stereotypical because that's the other thing right when they do write stories about black or black or brown children uh, they are always under the umbrella of some stereotype. And I didn't want the stereotype to um, counteract her struggle with her sexuality. So I made sure she had a two-parent household and they weren't poor and they weren't struggling, struggling, struggling. Uh, they lived in the hood by choice, but it wasn't the hood. I mean, you know what I mean? It was, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Watts Watts at that time wasn't a hood until the the uprisings. And that's part of the story as well. So I think that there, there was a lot of care that I put into the book. And even with the white people that I wrote into the story, I made sure not to stereotype them as well, right? Um, there, there was the one racist guy, <laughs> but then there was also there was also the Jewish guy that owned the 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 um corner store and he cared for the people in the community. But a lot of a lot of the characters that I created were based on research that I did uh, about Watts during that time. So I feel like even Watts yeah. itself was a character in the story. Um, all of which had to be handled delicately because again, I wanted to show um, the beauty and richness of the black community and not the struggle and strife that, you know, a lot of people create when our stories are told. Exactly. Lisa? Um, 
putting on my teacher hat, I teach this um, article from 1967 um, called The All White World of Children's Books um, by a librarian in 1967. And um, although things are getting better, we're still talking about it. And that is um, really interesting and awful. <laughs> um, and I, I really appreciate the people who are working today to make that change. Um, I can't remember the year, but it was in the 1990s, the librarian Rudine Sims Bishop um, create, uh, came, uh, created this term um, call, which is mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And so she talks about children's books should be a mirror. So you want to see yourself in a book. Um, it should be a window. You can look at other people's lives in books and sort of learn from them. Um, and then a sliding glass door that maybe you could just go through to another world and sort of grow empathy. Um, and I think that is such a brilliant thing. And we need more and more stories like that. In my... Um, picture books, the airport book and the hospital book, it's it's very actually Richard Scarry like in that it shows like what you do at the airport, what happens at the hospital. And I put in a ton of people that you would see at an airport and a hospital. It's where people come together from all different places, all different shapes and sizes. And um, it reflects the world around you, again, without stereotyping, like Lodine said, it's just people you see. Right. So, so Lisa, how do you decide on your, your target audience when you're putting together a, a children's book or a youth book? I write what I want to read. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then my editor decides who gets it. <laughs> um, I feel very strongly that picture books um, should be read a lot longer than they're offered. Um, to children, I don't know if Oliver as a picture book person or a comic person would agree, but you can get very sophisticated when you have word and image working together, more sophisticated than an early reader that has to have short words and teach kids to read. So it is a truly interactive form and you can get very deep and very sophisticated in a picture book. Well, so you don't have a specific uh, age group uh, that you're targeting when you start to write. It's just going to come out the way it's going to come out, right? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, for picture books, you know that it's for younger kids and for a right. comic book, maybe a little bit older, but right. you're not, you know, I write the way I write. And then sometimes um, an editor will say, can we tone this down a bit? Because maybe it, you know, could be more accessible um, to a different group of kids, but mostly... I just write for myself and then see where it goes. Oh, okay, Oliver? Well, as a book publisher who works with a distributor, uh, the format dictates the age range of the audience. So for picture books, you know, it's commonly three to seven, or you could go up or down a little bit. But uh, beyond that, you get into chapter books and young adult. But, um, you know, once you have that category, you want to come out with a 40 page or a 32 page hardcover. Uh, for kids, it's fully illustrated. Um, you know, I think you have to follow your heart's desire, just like Lisa mentioned, where uh, you write what you want to write. And I think there are a lot, of, a lot of other publishers who are very conscious or are restrictive when it comes to vocabulary because of the leveling of uh, the content. But for us, you know, as Lisa mentioned, we want to play with the form. We want to be interactive. We want to kind of push the envelope and challenge kids just like we want to challenge ourselves as creators. So I think a good example for us is the Octonauts. Um, if anyone's not seen the television show, um, you know, it's about eight animals who are teammates in a uh, undersea uh, base who go out and have fun and uh, sort of uh, do their part to do good things under the water. And so uh, for us, uh, we wanted to, to show this world, which is kind of beyond uh, our normal experience because most of us don't scuba dive and do things like that or jump into a submarine. But um, we played with the form because we were making the book go in different directions. You had one book, the very first, you actually had to rotate the book 
four times 90 degrees to go in a complete circle. And to this day, people still think it's a misprint. And they call me and say, <laughs> you know, should this book be quarantined because there's a mistake? It needs to oh be returned. God. And so uh, that just means that, you know, people are used to convention and that's yes. not necessarily their fault. But when you defy convention, you kind of invite the suspicion or the ire of these people who kind of enforce a standard, whether it's their or just imaginary. So I think it's incumbent upon any creator to decide where they want to kind of push and pull. Uh, but for us, it's always been important because we think that is a way to really um, make something unique, not just for the sake of being special, but to help convey the story. Yeah, it sounds like there's already a matrix of what goes with what there, <laughs> almost. Uh, Glodine? Uh, I actually hadn't intended on writing a young adult novel. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm writing about a 12-year-old. Why would I not think that a 12-year-old <laughs> would want to read it? But I, in my head, the reason I wrote the book was because um, there was, well, I was at Mills at the time, and I was 36 and everyone else was half my age. I had had a yeah. lot of experience. And um I had told the girls when I would meet them, I am not trying to be your play mom or your play auntie. Like I'm a college student, just like everyone else. But I noticed like if I would give them a ride home, they would be like cute dykes at school. And then they would, I would take them home and they'd come to get in the car dressed, dressed like girls. And I'd be like, what's going on? And I, I got to go home. My grandmother doesn't know or my aunt doesn't know or my parents don't know. And I was like, wow, okay, I got that. And then a friend of mine's um, sister uh, died from uh, AIDS. Her husband was uh, creeping around and gave her um, HIV. So I, I just felt like all of this is happening because of people's kind of stagnant thoughts around sexuality. So how do I get them to open their eyes that it's not necessarily a choice. You know, I think it's easy for us to compartmentalize and say that people choose to be a certain way, but that would be like, I chose to be black so I could be persecuted for, for the <laughs> Your entire life. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I wanted adults to read the book and understand that this could be what your children are dealing with. And then it occurred to me, hold on, time out. The kid might be reading the book and what do they need to learn, right? What do they need to see your character struggling with? And so it really actually helped me get more connected with my character. Um, and I'm glad that I had that mind shift because I'm not sure the book would have been as successful if I just had the adult in mind. So once mm -hmm. I, I included kind of that that child's perspective and um, what kids needed to see that would represent what they probably were feeling. Um, I even got more connected to writing the story. Um, and I've had a lot of young people tell me that one of the things that they love about um, Zayla's story is that she, um, she didn't try to, I, one of the kids at Willard, I did a pilot at Willard um, Middle School just to see how young people would um, take to the book. And they all felt like one of the things they loved about Zayla is that um, she represented them in some way that I hadn't even, wasn't even intentional. I was just writing a 12 year old the way I would, not even the way I was a 12 year old, but the way that I envisioned a 12 year old. And, um, and it, she connected, but then she also connected with the adults who became very protective of her and um, got it. I think they got it. I've had a couple people tell me they didn't want to read it because their religious beliefs, whatever. And then they read it and they were like, I love her. Uh -huh. Now I have a different perspective. And I was like, score, that was the point. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that going forward, um, my audience will be kind of what Lisa and Oliver said. I'm going to write the story that I think needs to be told. And I feel just like with this story, the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry, my brain just shut down. But um, the elements that relate to, to different people will be there um, 
for yeah i think that's what i'm trying to say but you touched on this a little bit glodine but what when you when you sat down to write and i, and I want you all to answer this question um what was your core mission i mean what 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 were you setting out to do when you when you write what are you setting out to do to open minds to open hearts and minds I create characters that people can connect with that opens their hearts so that then they can open their minds to whatever the character is going through. That part was, yeah. that part is everything that I do. Um, yeah, <laughs> I I will just say this is a, um, not a shameless plug, but I just, I was <laughs> diagnosed with stage four lung cancer in November. Yeah. Um, and I'd been writing this book in my head. I can't believe I wrote this book in a week, but it's a illustrated book about kind of one side is it's all about you, the person that's going through cancer. And then the other side is it ain't about you for the people that are supporting them. But even in writing this book, um, it's intended to be humorous, right? Because I'm poking fun at the fact that people acted like I had leprosy. Like cancer is not contagious. Why are you standing over there looking at me like you're going to catch it? Um <laughs> But but I I think that um, writing it from the perspective of my lived experience and what I would want if I was in the situation. I mean, I was in the situation, so it's a different experience. But like Zayla, I, I wasn't struggling with my sexuality, but I wrote that story based on what I would have wanted to have happen if I was in her situation and the challenges that I faced. How would I how would I deal with that? Uh, in a way that helps other people see themselves. That's kind of my goal and objective to everything I do. Thank you. And you, Lisa? Um, I almost, I think I forgot the question, but I can, I can what, go what is on. Your, what's your core mission when you sit my down? My core mission. Do what you um, do. Yeah, my core mission is art and literature. And, um, so I come at a story um, that I want to tell. Um, and then it it sort of, if it's a good story, will sort of become something that people can relate to. And so um, I have, my first graphic novel was called The Phantom Twin. And it's about conjoined twins at a circus sideshow in the early 19th, 1900s, um, <laughs> which I did not experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I always, uh, when I was talking about outsiders, I always loved thinking about performers, thinking about a sideshow, thinking about um, the gaze, like looking at someone um, sort of in an exploitative way, and then mm -hmm. sort of agency that those people had as performers um, to exhibit themselves the way they wanted to or the way they didn't want to. And um, by writing that book and creating a story when I was finished and I was promoting it, I th thought, oh, it's about teenagers. It's about people who walk through the world and think everyone is looking at them and they're yeah. about freaks, right? And right. that is something that everybody understands. Um, everyone has felt like a freak at some point and felt like no one else is like me and no one else can understand what I'm going through. And I am totally like a horribly awful, ugly person. And um, so it feels like the art comes first and then the realization of what I'm doing comes later in many ways. Although yeah. with my children's book, like the airport book, I definitely had a like, let's show humanity at an airport and let's sort of demystify the journey. So I, I come from it at, at both ways. Great. Oliver, support in um, doing what you do. Sure. Well, I, I appreciate uh, Glodine for sharing that uh, motivation for her latest story, because I think that epitomizes, you know, one of my goals, which, you know, it has to be personal. It has to come from something that you yourself are not just interested in, but uh, there's a compulsion, whether it's because uh, you find it fascinating or funny or just something you need to, to put into words to, to manifest out there in the world. And that's, you know, something you want to share 
it's not it could be a deep dark hidden secret but it's something that you strangely want to share so i think that's one thing uh in that sense it's not work it's not an assignment that somebody gave you which is drudgery um and you sometimes do those things just to pay the bills but uh, the second thing would be for me uh there's a professional need that uh this book, this topic doesn't exist out in the world. And because of that, there's a hole on the bookshelf, which deserves to be filled. And it shouldn't be filled just because it's a shelf taker upper, but it's something that um, is an oversight that somebody didn't really care enough to make this. And it has a worth, it has a value. And the third thing, it has a value to whom? To the reader. And for us, they're two different readers. There's the child, and then there's the parent or the caregiver. And they're, they're two different people with two different intellects, two different levels of interest. But right. everything we do, uh, we want to uh, craft in a way which appeals to both of those readers in different ways. Because, uh, you know, Sally or Johnny, they don't go to the store with their credit card. You know, mom and dad have it. And unless... Um, mom and dad have a very long day and do whatever the kids want. You know, they're the decision makers when it comes to checkout. So uh, at some level, it does have to appeal to them because they're the one authorizing um, that transaction. And so um, for both of those people, there has to be a value, which is not hopefully just immediate, but they see it and they it triggers something in them. But uh, in the book itself, that uh, it can deliver on um, these different levels of meaning. So uh, for us, uh, we try to balance all those things when you come up with an idea, but uh, the starting point is personal, then it becomes professional, but you always have to remember who uh, the end customer is. Yeah, and you you hit on one of the key words for all of this, and that's value. It has to have value. Uh, Nico, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, I actually have an audience that emerged. Um, we talked a lot about stories so far and about the um, impact and the mission that we want to have when writing these stories. But let's think about the images, like how do the images or how does the visual elements of the story, crafting the story, um, have this reciprocity with the story? Um, yeah, I have, I have that question here on deck. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Lisa, would you like to start with that? The answer to that question: How how do you intersect the words and the the illustrations, and how important are the illustrations? Um, the illustrations for a picture book are integral. Um, I talk about in my classes, and so one one class I teach is picture book writing and illustrating uh, to illustration majors, and I talk about if the words say it, the pictures don't need to say it. If the pictures say it, the words don't need to say it. So they're working uh -huh. together very closely. And I say children can read um, the visual imagery at the same time as the adult reads the text to them. And I, I really think a great picture book is a book that has um, something going on and sort of a second story in the imagery than the text. So it's truly an interactive experience. And I have to say that my child was obsessed with the Octonauts. And one of the reasons is there was so, it's full of stuff, um, Richard Scary style, there's so much to look at. And so I think that's really important that um, there, there are things in the image that are not reflected in the text because you're reading both together. Interesting. Claudine. Well, my illustration would be the scenery. The um, Right. In this case, uh, like I said, I, I made Watts a character in the story because I wanted people to feel like they were on those streets, that they were seeing the same things that Zaylu was seeing and having the same experiences. And part of that scenery includes the characters, the secondary characters that make up the community um, that she lives in or anyone that I'm writing about, those secondary characters are important. They need to they need to uh, represent the um, scenery as well. So uh, I, I had a lot of people, I wasn't even born during the, the Watts uprisings. 
Uh, the only thing that I ever saw about Watts during that time were photographs. Um, but I lived in Watts when I was in uh -huh. high school. And the, in fact, the house that Zayla lives in is the house that we lived in. And that community, even though it was the 1980s, the community was still as close knit as it was during the Watts uprisings. And when I started writing the book, I remembered my neighbors telling me how close knit uh, the community was. And so I tried to recreate that, even though I didn't really know what that looked like. I can imagine what that would look like and feel like having grown up uh, in the summer, my mother sent me to Chicago to get a break because I was a bit of a handful <laughs> <laughs> being an only child. Um, and so, it, it, you know, back in those days in in Chicago, all the adults were responsible for the kids. So this, right. you know, we didn't grow up. I didn't grow up in a time where you could say an adult was lying. Like, what did you say that? And now you think you're going to continue living? I don't think so. You um, could, we couldn't even say fool. Exactly. Like there was just, there was a sense of responsibility. And so I wanted to recreate that, um, that as well. So yeah, I spend a lot of time getting really familiar with the, the environment that the uh, characters are going to live in so that that becomes as integral as part of the story as the story itself. So these are um, writing the words uh, graphically enough that people can picture. Yeah in their heads yeah. where, where you are with the words. Where you are. Yeah, there's a scene in um, the book where the father takes um, Zayla to his nightclub and they're sitting on the roof. And I felt like this would be a great time for people to kind of get an aerial view of Watts and, and like kind of see it from a different perspective. Um, and it's done through, uh, there's a pigeon that flies off the, off the ledge and she follows, she's telling you where the pigeon is flying over, but it's describing kind of like the playground and the corner mm -hmm. store where the lady sells candy out of her, off her back porch and um, that kind of that kind of experience uh, as well, where you're not even talking to anyone specifically, but you're getting this visual uh, as this pigeon is flying toward the Nickerson Gardens. Um, and they don't look like, you know, the projects the way they're stereotypically uh, described. They were housing, um, they were homes, I should say, back then, where people cared about their their homes and they took care of uh, the outside as much as they took care of the inside. So, yeah. So we have the artistically drawn um, visual on the page. We have the mental visual that comes from the words. Uh, how about you, Oliver? Uh, well, first off, I always appreciate uh, Lisa's comments, so thanks for the compliment there. Uh, second off, <laughs> uh, as a kid growing up, you know, it was always the pictures which attracted me, and that's why I wanted to be a cartoonist. And then when I shifted gears and tried to do more of the writing, I had to work with people who I wanted to create these worlds who I, I had to have them much better than me as, as artists. So uh, I always think of it as a marriage. Uh, it's a functional marriage, not a dysfunctional one. And sometimes it's an arranged marriage, but uh, there has to be communication. And there are a lot of publishers where uh, the writer never actually talks to the artist. They just see it finally in print. Uh, for us, it's the opposite. There's this two-way conversation where not anything goes. And if someone has a suggestion that can improve one or the other, um, that's really the goal. So uh, we've had the fortune to work with a lot of um, artists who are animators and they understand this idea of a storyboard and you know whether it's an animated tv show or a feature film or even a comic book uh, they understand that there has to be a core image which represents the ideas of that text or those two sentences on that page and uh, for us that's a kind of um, crucial idea because uh, we want that picture because there are only 32 of them uh, to really pack a lot of punch and deliver extra yeah. information like Lisa mentioned. So uh, the kicker is we want our goal is to have every picture be so fantastic, so necessary, so uh, unique that, you know, if someone were to chop up that book, uh, they'd want to put that picture on their wall. And yeah. uh, that's our goal. And if we can meet that, at least for ourselves, 
uh, we want to kind of deliver that value to the reader where they can't really even envision another way of depicting those those ideas or that conversation. So uh, we want to avoid that kind of family portrait photo at all costs, where you should see the same people from the same point of view, from the same perspective, um, which is kind of mundane. We want to kind of create that dynamism, the vibrancy, the the active motion, and uh, the close-ups of emotion with facial expressions, which really kind of um, fill in all the blanks. Well, you know, as, as writers, no matter what our genre, we all want to feel like we have accomplished something and that we have reached someone somehow. So uh, Oliver, what would you say has been your greatest triumph, achievement, um, best feeling in doing what you do? Well, it doesn't really come from what I feel, but I think what an, uh, the audience feels. And uh, you don't do it in a vacuum. The goal is really to share it in person uh, with people. And you can't do that in every sense because, you know, with the economies of scale, you do want your book to be in places you'll never go and to reach yeah. people you'll never meet. But if you do have the occasion to be in a school or a library or um, social settings and people come up to you and say, well, you know, I've always liked that book or it happened to me just a couple of months ago. It made me feel really, really old. I was at this <laughs> event and they said, oh, you know, we we loved your books when our kids were kids. And now my kid is, you know, 24 years old and here she is. And, oh, this is the author that you liked that book of. And uh, it's like the passage of time kind of, uh, it's a double-edged sword. But to me, the person who's now an adult who loved your books, uh, you know, it's a little late in the process, but, you know, it's still that sense that, you know, you made a difference however unquantifiable to that person's life and that family's life. And I think that's that's the goal for any writer, unless they're writing things which uh, are meant to scare you <laughs> or <have laughs> yeah. to submission and make you fear for your life. Uh, but for the yeah. things that we do, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the icing on the cake. Wonderful. Goldine. Yeah, I would say the same thing. One, one of the things that I love um, is hearing people laugh. Um, a lot of my books have humor or, well, the book I just finished, I gave it to my oncology nurse while I was getting chemo the other day and I could hear her laughing and I was like, that's exactly what I wanted. That's what you wanted. That's yeah. what I wanted. And and when she gave it back to me, um, one of the things that she said is you took like a subject, you know, cancer is a scary thing, but you made it accessible and um, you put humor on it, which, you know, will make people kind of take a step back and maybe not take it so serious, not that they don't take it seriously, but you know, they don't put uh, fear, kind of relieve the fear. And it's the same thing with um, my novel. Uh, people either told me or the reviews that were written on Amazon and um, all the other places, uh, people said that they laughed and they cried. Yeah, uh, they felt all the feels, which is which was my intention, um, because in life we have to feel all the feels, right? Feel. We, can't just, we can't just feel good all the time, and so um, yeah, I I love to hear, but I really have all the emotions. It would make me sad if I saw somebody crying. And in fact, a friend of mine um, <laughs> sent me a text message from the airplane, and he was like, "I am so mad at you right now." I started off this plane ride mm -hmm. laughing, reading your book, and I just finished bawling. And I had to tell you, the person sitting <laughs> to me is probably going to buy the book because I went through all these emotions. <laughs> he acted it out for you. <laughs> he was like, I couldn't help it. I didn't even see it coming. And then all of a sudden I was crying. And um, and so anyway, that that. I just, I believe that we have to feel our feels and, and we live in a society where you're supposed to shut it down and boys don't cry and women are too emotional and blah, 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 all that nonsense. Um, I think that we have to honor our feelings and writing, writing, reading something that can pull that out of you, I think is like a blessing. So, and that, and that's not just a, a, a place for adults. Children need to have that place. Children need to have them too. Exactly. exactly. Uh, Lisa? <laughs> Um, well, first of all, I'm sorry, Oliver, my 
kid is 20 now. <laughs> um, and I, I do agree with both Glodine and Oliver. It's like seeing um, someone connect to one's book is like seeing someone connect to yourself, like to yeah. you. And it's really beautiful um, when I see children, and I hear um, their caregivers say they read it over and over and over again. That's just a, a super special feeling. It doesn't happen so much with adults and the and the books for adults because uh, you know we read a book once and maybe we go back to it years later, but we're not like reading it every night. Um, so that's really special. And um, something I love more than anything is um, when my students produce something that is um, incredible. And I feel like I'm pulling stories out of them. Um, I have a student who last spring, her first book came out with Chronicle Books, which is local San Francisco publisher. And it was a story that she had started in my classroom. And I thought it was, it was a very personal story. I thought it was a very important story. It's called, um, Yanebi's Drive to School. And it's hmm. the story of um, when she and her sister were little, they lived in Mexico, they're American citizens. So her mom put them in the car and drove them over the border every morning to go to El Nunchi school. And it just talks about that journey and how the border between America and Mexico is so porous. And people don't understand that. There are people living and working on both sides, going back and forth, citizens of both countries. And I mean, the artwork was exquisite. Everything was delightful in that book. And now it, it's reaching a huge audience, a big wide audience. And that's really important. So her name's Sandy Santa Maria. Look her up. What's the name of the book again? It's called Yanebi's Drive to School. Okay. <laughs> so Lisa, how, how do... Um writers of, of children and youth books go about finding an illustrator? Oh, um, usually, I would say about 90% of the time, the editor and art director after a manuscript is sold um, and is accepted by a publishing house, pair an illustrator with the author. And one of the reasons is they like to, they have a, a wide array or a stable of illustrators that they're interested in and they're constantly looking for new voices. And when you have an uh, experienced writer, they often try a new illustrator and vice versa in order to yeah. um, sort of create a market for that book. And they're very careful about finding voices that will reflect each other. Um, that said, there's a very rare cases where an illustrator and an author knows each other and um, submit a book together. But that's very, very rare. And it's usually only when um, one of them is a known quantity. But as Oliver said, it's a really special thing to get to do a book and create it at the same time, the art and words, because you can get much deeper and much richer, which is what I did for my book, Mummy Cat with Marcus Ewart. So we got to sit together once a week at a cafe, he's local and, um, just sort of chew over the story. What am I going to draw? And how is that going to reflect in the text and vice versa? And, oh, you might not need that word or, oh, I think you should change that little piece of art. And it really made a very cohesive, beautiful book. Good. Uh, Oliver, do uh, you have anything to add to that? Uh, Lisa pretty much said it all. I think that sometimes, you know, there is an artist who has an idea and wants to write though. Um, they may not have been known as a writer, and we often take that tack. Uh, but as, aside from understanding how a writer wants to see a potential version of this world they're creating, you know, I, I understand that motivation. I understand that need. And um, it's not really necessary that the writer pay out of their own pocket to commission that, especially if it may turn out that a publisher likes the story, but doesn't necessarily like the artwork. So, um, but uh, leaving all, aside the whole AI generation question, uh, I, I do think that there are people who are willing to be paid a small amount, much less than a, a standard contract for an artist to uh, do some comps for somebody. And 
uh, you can find those over you know certain websites but also through local art schools so um i don't think it's you know absolutely 100 percent necessary that a, the writer pay for all that just to see their vision come to life but uh, if they feel that compulsion you know there are ways to to make that happen hello dane well this is this um it's all about you book uh my friend is an artist, a beautiful artist, and um, we're doing it together. But uh, I started my own publishing company when I published Salmon Croquettes because it came, it was finished during COVID and I wasn't getting, it was like the whole publishing industry shut down right when my book was done. And I didn't want to wait for whenever it was going to open back up. So I started my own publishing company. But I think with this, um, I am going to try to go the traditional route because just people that have read it so far, I think they, they love the idea that it's two books in one, but I'm kind of uh, attached to the illustrator. So I don't know how I'm going to feel about that. If, if they want me to use a different illustrator, we'll see. I'm just going to, I'm just going to see what happens there and see what happens. Yeah. So I don't, yeah. I can't say I have a lot of experience in that space. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the um, uh, starting your own uh, publishing company because so far, you know, these answers have really been about um, traditional publishing. And I, and, I, and I have to ask the question for those indie writers out there, uh, what, are, what kinds of resources do they have for uh, illustrators? What can they do? You, you mentioned Oliver Art Schools. Um, that's that's one place. And Lodine, you you have a friend. Um, are there any others that any of you can can think of to offer to some of the indie writers out there, Lisa? Um, well, as as Oliver said, it's it's pretty rare um, to find your own illustrator. But of course, if you want to self publish, um, which is a wonderful uh, option, um, you do have to find illustrators. Um, one resource uh, that I often talk about when people ask me to find an illustrator is um, a, a website that two illustrators, one of whom I'm very close to, have started. It's called uh, womenwhodraw.com, I believe. Oh. And um, it's a database of uh, women and non-gender conforming uh, artists. And it, if you want an artist who sort of uh, reflects the the background or the voice that you like, you can look um, for them, you can filter it by location or ethnicity or religion or language. Um, and in that way, I mean, just there's so many talented people on that site and you can just scroll through and they're all, you they connect to their portfolios. So that's a really great resource of how to find an artist. Wonderful, thank you. Um, in the last uh, minute we have, I wanted to ask each of you if you have anything you'd like to add that we didn't, you didn't get to say. Um, Oliver? Well, given the topic, I think that, um, you know, it's always important to imagine yourself as a child and yeah. maybe not how you were as a child, but like a, a current child, a 21st century child. And if you don't know one or you're not related to one, it's a little bit hard to meet them. Uh, because there are all those signs out there by the playground. This is a bad joke. But um, <laughs> aside from that, I think that, you know, tastes do change as well as the media landscape like we were talking about earlier. And, you know, just the competition for hours of the day or um, the eyeballs. And the children today like different things. And it's natural. Uh, they're not so substantially, you know, so radically different. But um, you should be aware of what they do like. And if you don't know what those things are, like I've never seen Bluey, even though I've uh, heard about it, you know, millions of times, uh, maybe you should spend a couple right minutes <laughs> watching that thing and see, well, what is that thing that is clicking out there and getting all the attention and becoming so successful? And, and those aren't necessarily the things you're, you're competing against, but in some sense you are. And so um, knowing what those kids watch and what they play and how they do it and what they spend their money on gives you a sense of, of what you may need to do to make them slightly interested in, this, in the thing that you're presenting. Thank you. Glodine? 
I'm just going to say it was a pleasure being here. I said everything I wanted to say. It was a pleasure having you here. Lisa? Um, I just want to put a plug in for children's librarians um, and piggybacking on what Oliver said to look at children's media, to look at what children's like. They are the most amazing resource. Yeah. They know the kids backwards and forwards. And they're under a lot of pressure right now. We talked about book banning. Um, and support your library, support your librarians. They know a whole lot. Hear, hear. I second that. Thank you, Glodine, Oliver, and Lisa. Thank you, Mechanics Thank Institute. You. Thank you. Um, I wanted I'll to just back close. to Nico. Yeah, I wanted to close, close out with just reminding people that we have a wonderful family story hour at Mechanics Institute tomorrow. As Lisa was talking about children's librarians, we are growing in our children's programming here as well. And I also want to end with a beautiful message from Robin Michelle, who wrote in the chat box, Thank you for such a thoughtful conversation, everyone, and your commitment to arts and young readers. I look forward to seeing more of your work. I also want to recommend all of our um, participants, if you can, to, um, to show your camera and also wave to the wonderful panelists today. Spread the love. Um, and we will end our writer's lunch today. And thank you once again for being here with us today. Bye. Thank, you, thank you, writers. Thank you, writers. Okay, thank, you, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for coming. Thank you.